three. Okay, I think it's recording now. Um, so hi, everyone. So good to see you. We've already done the good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, it just seems like a compulsory element of Zoom calls these days <laughs> because everyone is joining from different parts of the world. Um, I'm sitting here in the UK um, representing JLI. We have Dan Williams from Hope with us, um, who you all know. Well, most of you will know by now. If you've joined before, you will know him because he's one of our um, co-chairs. He's still waiting for Assad from Islamic Relief. Um, he might just um, join us in a in a couple of minutes as well. Um, yeah, and we're really excited to be here with you today. There yeah, are not that many here today, but that's probably because it's um, the end of the summer and we also just spoke about it in the um, when we were just chatting informally that people are probably busy with um, he's on holiday or they're coming back from holiday and getting the kids um, ready for school again. Um, but it doesn't really matter for this meeting because we can have a really good discussion also if it's a relatively small group and also see that people are still joining now. So that's absolutely fine. Um, oh, there's Zeynep. Hi, Zeynep. <laughs> Zainab is also from the jail. I'm sorry. Um, no problem. No problem. So good to see you. Hi. <laughs> okay. So um, in terms of what we'll do today, um, we thought we'll um, we do another round of introductions. We did this last time, um, but um, all of you may not have been there. We always think it's, um, it's nice to know who's in the call um, with us. Like for, for every one of us, right? It's nice to, to know who is here. Um, these sessions are really about shared learning and we can do this best when we know who the other people in the room are. Um, so um, that's what we'll start with. Um, just um, if people can just say um, who they are, um, which organization they're, they're representing, if, if they are affiliated with any um, organization. Um, and then maybe also, just very briefly why they're here. We'll do that first. Um, after that, um, we'll have some time for group discussion. So you know that usually we'll have a speaker, someone um, from the group or beyond to share some of their experience related to Meal and Faith. Um, and then we have a discussion after that. We thought this time we do things a bit differently and um, we'll just have a learning exchange where everyone in the group um, contributes. Um, we thought it would be a bit more dynamic, something different, um, to mix up things a little bit. Um, and um, yeah, so we'll do that. Dan is going to, um, to walk us through that. We have prepared a couple of questions, but if, there, if you have any questions that you are really interested in, then you can also just, yeah, just throw them in the, um, in the, in the round and then we can, we can have a chat, chat about that. The focus we thought um, could be how COVID has impacted our meal and faith work. Because um, it's obviously been one and a half years now. We all have some experience in this area now. We thought now would be a good time to, to talk about that. Um, yeah, and then after that, depending on how the discussion goes, if you are so engaged and you just um, enjoy um, the shared learning and exchange so much, we can, um, we can pretty much spend the rest of the session on that. If um, we do have some time in the end, we can also quickly update you about, um, about some of the meal and faith focused um, projects that we have been um, running at the, um, at the JLI together with our partners. It's good that um, Alliance for Peace Building, I mean, Suraf <laughs> is here today because um, I have been working with him on one of these. Um, so yeah, if we have a couple of minutes um, in the end, we can also speak about that. So does this sound good so far? Is everyone happy? Do we have any questions, objections, major concerns? No, they're, they're all smiling. The ones I can see, they're all smiling and nodding their heads. So I think that's a good sign. Um, okay, so yeah, then let's just do, um, let's just do introductions then. And um, Asad was supposed to moderate this part of the session. He's not here yet. So I just um, step in for him. Um, so I think, um, yeah, I think you all know me by now. Um, um, my name is Jennifer and I'm with the JLI. I'm 
senior research associate with EPLI, have been with them since September last year. I was involved a little bit with the Meal Hub before that because I was um, co-chair, hub co-chair together with Dan for around six months um, when I was still working for Islamic Relief in the UK. I used to be the head of research. And um, why do I attend the sessions? Because I get paid for it. <laughs> they kind of need me here. <laughs> okay, and um, on that note, I'll hand over to Saraf. Hi everyone, this is Saraf. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm with the Alliance for Peacebuilding um, and I am a research manager with the learning and evaluation team. Yeah, I'm attending just to sort of uh, listen in and share if possible, but like learn from all of you about some of the sort of maybe creative things that have been happening around meal, especially during COVID. Um, so looking forward to listening and learning from you. Thank you. Thank you, Sorav. Um, next in my, on my screen, there is Zainab. Zainab, do you quickly want to introduce yourself? Hi everyone. So I spent most of the day on So that's why. Uh, I'm Taylor from Lebanon. I come from a media studies and research background. I recently joined the JLI to work focuses on organizing the first dialogue in the Middle East, which also includes the the convening of a regional meal hub for the Middle East specific. Just I'm monitoring my plans, our plans, the JLI plans for the region. Thank you, Sam. Thank you. Thank you so much, Zainab. Um, I couldn't hear Zainab very clearly. Was this an issue for anyone else? Yes, okay. So Zainab, the connection doesn't seem to be very good, but don't worry about it. I just um, I just give a quick summary. So Zainab um, joined GLI um, a couple of months ago and um, she's mostly been working on our fair and equitable um, initiative, which looks at how we can do um, development and uh, humanitarian and peace building work in cooperation um, with or as faith actors ourselves in more fair and equitable ways. Um, so she's been working a lot on, on that. Um, Zainab is from Lebanon. She has a background in, um, in media and research. And she's been doing absolutely amazing work on the Fair and Equitable Initiative. As part of the Fair and Equitable Initiative, we're looking into setting up a regional meal hub in the Middle East. Um, and those of you who have um, attended previous session, you remember that we spoke about that. And um, yeah, because of that, we thought it would be good for Zena to actually also see um, what the global meal hub looks like. And that's why she joined the session. Um, and Zena, don't, don't apologize, it's fine. We all have internet issues at one point. It's just good that you're here. And yeah, we're so happy that you, that you did, did manage to join us. Um, if there's anything, if I've missed anything in the introduction, just type it in the chat, Zena, um, um, other than what I've said. Okay, and then we'll go, um, we'll go on and um, we'll ask Nadira to introduce herself. Hi everyone, um, I actually go by Sara, so half of my second name, um, just, I, it's an Indonesian thing, I don't know. <laughs> but um, my name is Saras, and I work with the International Center for Religion and Diplomacy. I'm based in Washington, DC. And at ICRD, I mostly handle the South and Southeast Asia programs, as well as the communications and development portfolio. Um, and something new that I've been doing at the organization is having innovation hubs every two weeks, where we um, get all of the staff together and talk about um, new concepts, ideas, best practices that we can use in our everyday program design and implementation. And one big thing that's important for me is um, how do you sort of use meal as a way to 
decolonize the development and peace building sector. Um, so anything that sort of transforms power and centers the dignity and agency of the communities we serve are things sort of that I'm looking for. And I hope to learn from all of you on how you've been doing that. And especially in the COVID context, because um, honestly, I see already has not been that innovative in the past and that's something you want to change. So. Great, thank you so much, Sarah. Um, we then have Mike from Michigan. M.M. -M, Mike from Michigan. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm uh, Mike Wagg. I am with uh, World Renew, which is a binational uh, faith-based organization. It's based in Canada and the U.S. I work out of the U.S. office as the monitoring and evaluation technical advisor. Um, and just in terms of um, background, um, uh, also worked in the kind of large donor world prior to World Renew. I came to World Renew from USAID as an ME specialist. So I'm, um, you have a background now in both kind of the implementer, the INGO world, as well as the, the, the funder or donor world. Um, yeah, I'm happy to share what we've been doing in terms of um, COVID adaptations, both kind of at an organization level and also at an individual level um, too. Nice to meet everybody. Nice to meet you. Yeah, very nice. Very nice to have you with us today, Mike. Um, and um, now we have Simon. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Simon Muniri. It's already there on the screen. Um, I work for uh, World Relief and I'm um, based in Nairobi. Uh, I work as a uh, technical officer for uh, SCOPE project, uh, basically uh, uh, RMNCH and HIV. Uh, most of my work has uh, been around this region uh, of Africa, uh, South Sudan, hey, uh, um, uh, Kenya, uh, uh, Malawi, and and, um, and and just around. So uh, uh, it's good to be here. Part of it would be learning from you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Simon. We're really, really happy to have you with us today. Um, next up is Sarah. Sarah, Sarah, Sarah. Do you want to go next, Sarah? Yeah, I would love to. Uh, my name is Sarah Hertine, and I work for AMG International. It stands for Advancing the Ministries of the Gospel. Um, we are based in Chattanooga, Tennessee in the United States, but um, we work in 35 different countries around the world. Um, we are national leader driven. So a lot of um, it's Christian based. And so a lot of um, pastors and local leaders that um, drive our work. Um, and so they're the ones that really kind of drive what programs um, are started um, and are driven. And so we have a wide range of different programs um, from child and youth development centers um, to um, medical um, hospitals and projects to some disaster relief and church planning and whatnot. Um, and so, so and I lead our um, monitoring and evaluation efforts. So yeah, it's nice to meet you guys. Great. Thank you so much, um, Sarah. And really, really nice to meet you too. Um, next up is Chantal, who was actually the first one um, in the call other than Dan and myself. Now she's one of the last to introduce herself. Sorry, Chantal. That's okay. Um, I'm at work. It's a little loud. I apologize. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Chantal. Um, I'm the co-founder of AARH. It's, uh, it's based in Africa, Benin. Um, that organization protects uh, the offense, the um, women's rights. Um, we deal with agriculture. We work on no hunger in southern Benin. We try to protect a lot of um, people who doesn't have uh, any family because there's a bunch of them. And uh, we also focus on people who are uh, I'm gonna say disability. Um, 
we work on those people as well. And we also focus on the human rights, which is mainly then to make a peace. Um, Africans, uh, they need um, focus on each other to build Africa in a better way. And uh, we saw that in two, uh, 2010. That's what I found the organization. And also the hospital, like a clinic, a local clinic, we don't have many of them, but we're trying to focus on that and see if uh, every community will have at least one clinic. So uh, it's hard thing to be far away from Africa because I was a victim of every, a lot of stuff, but being a refugee for 20 years in Africa, uh, in America, I'm trying to start from somewhere to help African nation. Not only that, include everywhere we can go around the world. So, um, and I was happy to join JLI. That was a couple months ago. Somebody introduced me from church. So I'm like, oh, I'm going for it. So I signed up for it. And right now our focus in is the irrigation because there's a big drought over there. We got like 500 people have no uh, water in their, their I'm going to say the farm are dry. They can have a food from October all the way they won't have a food. So we focus on irrigation, help people to see how to grow their own food, even though there's no water and stuff like that. So thank you, everyone. And I'm happy to join you guys. Thank you so much, Chantal. And we're so glad that you're here with us today. Um, and then. Let me just check the second screen. Yeah, last but not least, we have Asad here, who, as I mentioned earlier, is one of the hub co-chairs. Asad, do you also briefly want to introduce yourself and say why you're here? Yes. Hi, this is Asad Taha. I am from the Islamic Relief. It is one of the leading faith-based uh, uh, and uh, Islamic uh, organization. We work across multiple sectors. Uh, and my background is um, uh, quality assurance, excellence, results-based uh, management, and uh, learning. Uh, we focus in internal organization transformation in mainstream best practices, which include monitoring evaluations and uh, learning and all those stuff uh, included. I am very excited to be among you as a, a professional in m and &E. I believe uh, you have a leading role in transforming your organization and maintaining the best practice across uh, the humanitarian and development sector. Thank you. Thank you much, so much, Asad. Um, okay, so that's the introductions done. Um, and with that, I um, hand over to Dan for the group discussion. Yeah, thanks, Jennifer, and, and good to be introduced or reintroduced to, to each of you. And yeah, for those that I haven't met or haven't introduced myself yet, I'm Dan Williams. I work at Hope International, which is a uh, Christian microenterprise development network. We have programs and partners in 16 countries around the world that do uh, microfinance institution building and then savings group mobilization through uh, church partners. And so um, I work in the, the team that focuses on our listening, monitoring and evaluation efforts, as well as uh, the team that focuses on what uh, what it means for our faith to be integrated into the work that we do. And so this, this learning hub has been at the perfect intersection of those, of those interests. Um, and so I'm excited for the conversation today. Uh, it was about 15 months ago that we had a, uh, a hub meeting that asked the question, how have we adapted uh, to COVID and how had organizations adapted their meal approaches uh, in the face of a newly developing pandemic. And uh, at that time it was, uh, if I could summarize, pretty much every organization threw out their existing books and, and put into practice some, some new uh, listening activities, some new monitoring activities, or had to 
adapt radically um, uh, to, to better understand the situation as it was evolving and, and how their organizations could best survive and, and meet the needs of the moment. Um, and now, a little over 18 months into this, this pandemic that we are still managing and that we are still facing, um, there, was, there were conversations months ago that were around the new normal, right? Um, and, and so we thought it would be appropriate to have a conversation today, not exactly trying to imagine the new normal or what the next normal is going to be, but to hear what has become uh, some of the more enduring adaptations um, that your organization has has had to make in, as it has continued to uh, try and conduct meal throughout this pandemic um, and and what are perhaps some of the challenges that you have encountered that maybe you've come up with some good um, uh, strategies for addressing uh, or maybe you're eager to learn from others in this community about how they have uh, addressed that same problem. And so we sent out uh, ahead of the meeting just some of the questions that uh, I, I could think of, of questions that uh, an M&E team might be facing as they are looking to adapt in this ongoing situation. And I'm going to try and put them in the chat here. So just one second while I get this copied in. Um, so you don't have to pull up that email, but these were some of the, the questions that um, that we thought might be relevant for us uh, to discuss as a group. And uh, this time is is a time that's intended to serve each of you. And so we'd love to hear from organizations that have encountered some of these challenges and have have something that you know, in humility, we can share and say, well, yeah, we think this is this is something that we've learned that is valuable to this community. Um, and also to be a space where if there's questions beyond of what we uh, uh, brainstormed as as a um, chair group um, that would be valuable for us to, to address. And so um, I am having a, having a moment trying to get things copied into the chat here. One second. Um, so, um, yeah, and so I would love to hear from the different participants how they've addressed some of these challenges. So the, the first challenge that we had identified was accounting for COVID's impacts. And so recognizing that one of the roles of M&E uh, or meal is often trying to assess impact. And there's a, a story that I love about a mouse and an elephant crossing a bridge together and the bridge shakes and they get to the other side and the mouse says, we really shook it didn't we? Um, and uh, our organizations uh, in the face of this pandemic are likely the mouse uh, walking alongside the elephant of COVID in terms of the impact our communities are experiencing. And so how, how are we accounting for that? Is that a challenge that you face within your organization? Um, the other thing that we thought would be interesting to discuss is the relationship and the, the activities of the faith actors with which we partner. Um, and so, you know, as hope, for example, as we think about our partnership with local churches, the ministry of local churches and the activity of our partners has changed. And so therefore, meal in that environment has also changed. And so would love to hear if organizations have experience with that challenge. Um, this is also a time uh, where faith is as relevant as ever. Um, and the intersection of faith and meal um, is, is an interesting thing for us to consider is how, how have those, we've seen those two um, uh, concepts or spheres of life and work, how have we seen them impacting one another uh, as, as this pandemic has, has gone on? Um, and then perhaps a bit more technical in nature as we, as we think about it, this is a question that I had for organizations um, that are doing longitudinal studies. And so say you were doing a baseline, midline, end line, and you did the baseline right before the pandemic started. And how, how are you addressing that challenge? Because I imagine that that uh, has posed some questions with whether to continue forward or to adapt. And so would love to have a chance to share about that. And then the final one was uh, household evaluations, which is an ongoing question that we've wrestled with as an organization of the ethics of going out and collecting data and how we do that in a way that is safe and responsible. Um, and at the same time, trying to still continue to understand 
what is happening and how we can best um, be of service to the communities where we're working. And so those are some of the questions that, that we came up with as a uh, hub committee. And so I will put those out to, to the group to and just ask for uh, the first person to be willing to share from their organization's experience, either in response to these questions or, or others that you came um, prepared with. So yeah, who would like uh, to share first from their organization's experience? And there was silence. I have a background uh, working with with middle schoolers, which means I am I have grown comfortable with, <laughs> with silence. silences. I just be quiet then and see who breaks the silence first. Who dares to break the silence? Hello, everyone. <laughs> I'm going to take it. <laughs> yes, thanks, Chantal. <laughs> so um, back home in southern Benin, they don't have many COVID, but it, the starvation is already there before pandemic anyway. So what we do over here is I call it use food. I mean, not oh storage people i call it shoes clothes and stuff and send to them and i encourage a lot of people to practice what we need to do and for the meal part there's uh, so many stuff they said people was telling me that uh the government has received so many funds to help people but they're not getting anything which is happening all the time we all know that so what i do um i send um money to to buy like mazes so we do collect those like three months in advance because we get to the time that there's no food that we we give that we pack that for three months later on and when people have no little uh, nothing to eat i make sure people come there and get some food and um and get rice and stuff all those stuff i do not get no fun from nobody is from my pockets because i have a two jobs first one is for my family second one is for the organization so i use it to help people it's not enough but people are getting help um has the pandemic hey it was the economy and stuff everything went down it was too much to to bear with but um my main thing is to get some strategy or some idea to see how we can help people, not only over there, but around the world, because this is gonna impact us for many, many years. And uh, it's time to start thinking together to, you're talking about baseline, midline, inline, and stuff like that we need. Um, we need to start working together and help people. That's how I see it. But that's what we did so far. Yeah, thanks for sh sharing, Chantal, and and yeah, thanks for your, your generosity and the support that you're offering to the community. Um, yeah, and and agree. This is why we are together, and and yes. looking to learn and support one another in in these challenges that we're facing. Um, yes. Yeah. Uh, well, I'd love to hear either from another organization and their experience, or I provided a list of five questions in the chat. What are some of the questions that your organization has wrestled with in the ongoing management of conducting monitoring, oh. evaluation, accountability, and learning in the midst of, of this uh, evolving environment? I hope I can ask a question, Dan, if that's okay. So one of the, I think, so I really like this analogy that I think it was like Arun the Viroy who, who wrote it who said something like the pandemic is a portal, right? Like is a portal through which the world can be better. We can't go to business as usual because the world wasn't working well back then. That's why we have the inequities that we have and, and all of the issues that we have. So 
we have to try and imagine a better world. And one of the one of the sort of advantages, uh, uh, dare I say, advantages of COVID has been more focus on um, like local actors doing meal and uh, being the people sort of being the people doing data collection because you know Western folks can't parachute in and and conduct meal and conduct interviews and so they've had to rely on more local people. I wonder how we could continue this practice and and sort of like I wonder if we could imagine sort of a future where local people are the ones not just collecting data but like designing the evaluations and monitoring plans. Um, what can we do to sort of make sure that this practice like continues and um, yeah like it's led by uh, folks who work in the communities um, questions are asked by folks in the communities um, the answers are found by folks working together collaboratively um, and things of that nature so I've, I've been grappling with that a lot and I, I wonder if you had any thoughts about how we could do that or yeah um, yeah that's a beautiful question go ahead Saras yeah, I have thoughts on that, but I also um, was thinking through some of the challenges that I was facing. Um, so as part of the comms portfolio at ICID, I was working on a couple impact evaluation videos where it's sort of um, a storytelling format with some of our past partners to see what was done well and to really get to know their story more than just as, you know, data collection, but as a human being, because um, this whole process, we're trying to humanize the entire meal practice that we do. Um, so that's one approach that we're taking. But one thing that always um, came to mind was the issue of accessibility um, in terms of language spoken, as well as internet connection, since now everything's moving to the digital world you have only a limited number like access to um, people who you can talk to and you might not necessarily get the ones who are directly impacted by your project just because they don't have that connection so that that's a, a big shame and it made me realize how you know privileged people are with good internet connection um, and English speaking capabilities. So what we've been doing to sort of circumvent that is getting some of our staff members and even people in our professional networks who speak the native language to come on us on these calls and allow um, our experts who are the communities that we're serving um, to speak in their native tongue so they can be as expressive as possible and not be constrained in um, sort of the language they know or the terms they know in English. Um, and going back to your point, Saraf, on how can we sort of do community-based research where it's the locals who own the information and are gathering the information. I think a shift into that way of doing m &E would only come when it's, it's mostly for, from the donor side because they expect certain metrics to be reported on and as the conditions for funding. I think we had a conversation one time about how every time we wanna innovate new m and &E approaches for a project, it's a lot of pushback because it's something they haven't done before and they don't wanna take the risk, especially during COVID where you know there's other priorities and they don't have space to innovate. So maybe, it's a lot about donor education and ad advocacy in order to make that happen. Maris, I that going off of what you're saying too, I wonder, you know, one of the things that we've struggled with with that question off of Sarav's question is um, is like empowering our local people since you know right now we've we've been um, working to measure our child and youth development projects and there's they're spread over 10 different countries and um, our struggle is like how do we standardize those measurements across those 10 different countries while also giving them the freedom and flexibility to you know um, you know to kind of like to speak into that process and so like that's our struggle is like and I would just add that in there is like, we've been really trying to figure out like, how do we 
you know, give them that voice and empower them, but then also like not make it this top down thing. Um, and that's been like our big struggle because like, I want so badly to like it to be like this grassroots thing and like them just to feel so empowered. But then like at the end of the day, I, you know, how do you, I don't want it to be so unwieldy where it's like, how do we then tame it where it's like, okay, now we have to put it back in like, and try to, you know, measure it. And so, I don't know, I just wanted to throw that out there too, of like uh, kind of as a question, as much as a statement, like, how do you, how have you guys wrestled with that? Like, that's our struggle. Um, yeah, yeah, I'd, I'd also share our struggles on the same line. Yeah, so we, with the school project where we're implementing RMNCH and also HIV, it's really data driven with PEPFAR. And most of our indicators, uh, like higher level indicator, you indicators you will have them through the national databases. Yeah, so DHIS to HIS and the, you know the databases from um, you at the national level. So we realized that well, uh, when the COVID uh, came in, we are not getting data. Uh, you go there looking at the you know morbidity data malaria for you fives, you know, you know, all those data that you need and it's not there. So data gaps and who is entering this data? So are the health facilities in the areas that we are covering um, are the health facilities. And um, so it's about monitoring. You are sending our ME uh, teams to follow up and uh, you find that, well, people are upset and uh, it's because of COVID. So it's a puzzle. How do you, how do you get people to enter that data? Uh, so you want to capture that data. Uh, do you incentivize them? Or what do you do? You know, these are government uh, employees. Um, uh, when working from the community, then they're CSW. Well, yeah, you can only work with them, but then they don't have control. Uh, to, to this system that gives you data. So <laughs> that, that's a, a problem. Uh, do, you, do you have a, a parallel like system to have your data collected and, and uh, collect the data? And, uh, you know, yeah, so we, we are sharing the same puzzle. Yeah, thank you. I um I don't have an answer to to any of the questions that people have asked, like Sarah's question or what Simon has just mentioned. But um I have another question. Um, so a lot of the uh, issues that people have mentioned um so far, they are related to doing meal on the ground, right? Um, and a lot of them are related to um having an international organization, um which maybe is not based in the country where they're collecting um, their meal data. And then how do you reconcile the two? Right? Um, and this is actually, this is a question that comes um, up quite often in our work. Um, and it's what is specific about working with local faith actors. Is it just like working with um, local actors in general, or is there something specific about, um, um, about collaborating with with local faith actors. And I guess that would be my question. What difference does working with or as faith actors make um, in the context of the conversations, conversation that we've been having about the impact of COVID? I guess maybe related to that would be kind of what is similar and what is different um, in working with a local CSO generally versus a local CSO that is faith-based. And um, for um, World Renew, I, I think what has happened with COVID is that it's, it's accelerated a number of trends that were kind of already in place pre-pandemic, um, some of which will be sort of helpful. And uh, World Renew works across um, a lot of different sectors. We have um, 
uh, in-country in presence, I think in 19 countries right now, um, and predominantly works through local faith actors. I'd say more than 90% of the programming is implemented through local faith-based organizations as opposed to directly by World Renew. Um, and so one thing that's happened with sort of COVID is, you know, that premium on technology that people have mentioned. So one thing that we did um, internally as an organization was reallocate funding that normally would have gone to travel last year towards technology purchase for both um, country office staff as well as local faith actors that we work with. Um, so we're talking like tablets, phones, um, to enable people to um, still not just do meal, but just work at all um, um, in, in an increasingly virtual space. Um, that said, most of the local faith organizations that we work with are still largely offline. So it's, um, it was um, sort of baby steps, I guess, um, in that, but it's, it's something that has been has been helpful. Another trend that was in place pre-pandemic that's been accelerated is the move towards um, using local evaluation consultants. That was, it was already pretty rare that World Renew as an organization would use Western consultants pre-pandemic. Usually it was only with our largest grants directed by the donor maybe in some cases um, but that's that's further accelerated um, both because of the practicalities of the difficulty associated with travel but also in increasing organizational consciousness of the importance of, of a decolonized approach to meal um, it's just kind of a variety of factors that came came together and kind of related to that, I know um, Saras had mentioned decolonization. I was asked recently to provide input to interaction on the design of a forthcoming webinar on decolonized meal um, and be happy to share updates or information related to that um, if people are interested. I put my email in the chat. And then um, lastly, so those are the things that happen at the organization level. At an individual level, I was asked to um, chair a session at a series of workshops at ALNOP, which works in the humanitarian space, convened on meal and COVID earlier this year. Um, and I'll put the publications that came out of that that were just released earlier this summer into the chat, because a lot of them speak to the kind of new normal, the sort of the long lasting changes that will persist even post pandemic in the way that particularly international NGOs um, work. So I'll, if those are of interest to people, I can I can put those in the, in the chat. Something that just came to mind when you um, brought up humanitarian organizations, I also volunteer um, part time at uh, humanitarian org that works in the migratory pathway with asylees and refugees. And one thing that we're tracking as part of our impact evaluation is trust in the community. How much do they trust our staff? And I thought that was interesting um, using it as a metric of success. Just to add so one more thing uh, to what Jennifer just said. One. Um, Jennifer, you said, or I guess uh, Jennifer and then Mike said, what is sort of similar and what's different between like faith actors and maybe secular actors? And one thing I've seen is, um, at least from my vantage point, working with some free groups is like, and this is not something you can necessarily replicate, but because of their sort of deep history and like the work they've been doing for a long time, I think faith groups are better tapped into some of the challenges and issues better. Like I've seen them being able to pivot and adapt uh, when COVID hit. So, you know, if they're running a particular program, they they pivoted and said, okay, food security is an issue now. So we, uh, and and also they're, they're often like nodes of, of a disparate sort of uh, networks in, in local communities. So 
like people would come to faith actors saying, you, you know, we're having issues um, um, around certain things. So, I mean, to give you an example, one of the best sort of adaptations I saw was this uh, project called Farms to Food Banks. So um, this was a project in, in the US in New Mexico where, um, you know, the faith group, which was which had worked in this area for the longest time, noticed that sort of um, the food bank shelves were going empty because of COVID, right? Like people had been unemployed, so they had been going to food banks to get, get food and things like that. But then they'd also been working with farmers in this community for the longest time and, and noticed that, you know, like farmers stock were going to waste because restaurants were closed. They were not getting, um, getting their sort of stocks into restaurants because you know of course covid closed the restaurants and stuff so because she was in that community and saw these two issues like she was able to connect the farms with the food banks and like i thought it was such a creative kind of way um to deal with sort of like a food security issue that had emerged um and for me that was because like uh, that that organization that that person had been embedded in this community for a long time so i think one of the advantages as a faith actor is this longevity. Um, and it also speaks to, you know, like um, organizations, not just parachuting in, doing work and going away, but like staying there, partnering for, for, for the long haul. So just wanted to share that. I just want to add something related to what Nadira just brought up uh, in terms of a trust that uh, we faced during my previous job with Adyan Foundation in Lebanon that sometimes we have the trust issue also from the donor themselves when when we are working on a project where faith actors implement community service activities in their community F from our participatory approach they are the best position to be collecting monitoring and evaluation data whether it is interviewing the community having them to uh, share stories of a change but when the donors know that they are faith actors who have uh, maybe visible religious identity or a status in the area, they just turn to be very suspicious and they start to make it more tighter for us and more difficult for us. And things started to get more complicated and that it needs supervision from a national uh, employee from the organizations, regardless of the fact that the monitoring and the evaluation data is reviewed by everyone and is analyzed by a participatory Approach. But uh, we, we face this challenge in terms of the trust when it comes to faith actors themselves collecting the data alone, which is really odd for me. Yeah, these are great contributions. And Mike, I would, I would say please do share those resources in the chat. Um, Going back to a couple of comments ago, I'll share a couple of things from from Hope International's experience that that we've been wrestling with ongoing to related to this this conversation. Um, uh, one of the things that we've come to terms with is it really matters who's asking the questions, um, not just the evaluators going out and collecting data, but what are the questions that the local faith actors are seeking to answer through their meal efforts. And so um, for our um, microfinance institutions, we have been on a long journey of um, really shifting from a board of directors, often a local board of directors for those local institutions um, that was perhaps more heavily represented by Westerners to more heavily represented by local professionals. And so the meal agenda of the organization is heavily driven by that that local board. And it that takes time. Uh, it, there's uh, patience required um, in, in that. Um, and you know it's way faster to say we've got a tool let's just go do it um but um uh, that ownership of these are the questions that are most important for urwego and rwanda for example to to answer and then for them to be able to share that back with hope international uh, as as the shareholder is is really important um and that has led to more local ownership of the meal agenda and more local improvement in the, the programming. I, I would say the other thing that uh, more specific to our, our partnership with local faith actors is there, there can often be uh, 
from the perspective of our partners, this overcomplication where a pastor looks at the savings group ministry that we are working with them to establish and they say, Hope, don't overcomplicate this. People like these savings groups. They join the savings groups and they continue to meet because they're really valuable. So, so valuable that they continue meeting even when uh, the pandemic is is raging. And so um, what, what else do you need to know? <laughs> it's kind of the, the, uh, the, the story that they'll they can can share and it's valid and and so um it's again saying like well then what what are the questions uh our partners that are most relevant for you in understanding how this ministry is is supporting your community supporting your um uh your church uh and and designing tools that that help to answer those questions together um and and sometimes in dialogue pushing back uh in helpful ways on you know a common a common trend within churches is health is measured in how many people are uh in attendance right uh, that's a and that has been uh we all know that is not the only measure uh and so pushing beyond those simple measures to say, yes, that's good. That's a starting point. And what else? And what else helps you to know that this is a healthy program that is having the impact that we wanna see. So those are a few things that we are are, are working towards and, and learning in terms of uh, uh, getting out of our own way uh, on our meal efforts. And I wanted to ask a quick question. I missed the first part of what you were saying. Did you say that you guys had um, like a meal like board at your guys's organization or was that just on your guys's like actual board? Uh, so each local organization that we partner with um, has their own governance structure. And so it's making sure that that governance structure is in fact a local governance structure and not um, I'm going to say this in a more direct way, a, a puppet governance structure, right? Uh, that is actual local ownership of the, the local organization and um, that they are the ones that are driving the meal agenda for the local organization. So it's not a meal specific governance structure, but it's the overall governance structure. Do you guys, just out of curiosity, do you guys standardize your you know questions across the board with hope or you do you let the locals mostly drive it based on each country we standardize uh areas of of interest so we're interested in learning about social impact spiritual impact material impact and, and personal impact and then there's uh freedom within that to explore what are the indicators and then the specific questions that most speak to those four areas. Okay, thank you so much, um, Sarah and Dan. I um, hate to do this, but um, we only have two minutes left um, and people may have other meetings. So as interesting as this discussion has been and as many more questions and comments we may have, I um, suggest we just Cut it off here. Um, if anyone has anything else, anyone would like to be in touch, um, just send us an email. Um, and you can also, Mike has already done that. He's um, put in his um, email address in the chat and people are more than welcome to do that as well. And then just follow up um, um, about some of these issues that have been raised. Um, did you, we, I think we're just going, yeah. No, I don't think. I know we're just going to skip the project updates now um, and you will just um, get them in our next session then, which is in October. Um, Dan, did you want to do the remainder of the um, wrap up or should I just go ahead? Yeah, you can go ahead. But thanks, everybody. This has been really rich conversation. Yeah, it's been great. Sorry um, that I'm... Um, rushing a bit now but I don't yeah don't want to delay people who may um, need to lock off to attend other meetings so just very quickly um, on the JLI website we have the schedule for the next meetings I've just put the link in the chat but feel free to reach out if you um, have any questions about that 
Um, the next session is on the 27th of October. And um, we'll probably skip the December session because who, who needs any more meetings towards the end of December? And then we'll just reconvene in the new year. So thank you so much, everyone. We really hope to see you in October. Um, and yeah, looking forward to discussions. Also, if you would like to present a bit more about your experience doing meal with local faith actors, um, and you think you could actually do a 10 minutes presentation to the rest of the group, then please be in touch, reach out to Dan or me. I'm just typing my uh, email address in the chat to reach out to Dan, me or Asad, because um, we're always looking for speakers. Um, and um, if we find more speakers, then we yeah we will go back to our usual um, usual format of people presenting and then us having a discussion based on that from the next session onwards. Okay, everyone, so good to see you and take care wherever in the world you are.